you know, I actually have a relatively feminine personality structure because I'm pretty high in negative emotion and I'm pretty high in agreeableness. And that's the typical feminine structure. And that, that's an interesting discussion to have too because, you know, we have this idea in our culture that you can be a woman born in a man's body. And that's not true. But you can definitely be a man with a feminine personality structure. Like 10% of men are as feminine in their personality as the average woman is. And vice versa, 10% of women are as masculine in their personality as the average man is. Now you can move those boundaries around and say, well, it's 5% and 40 or something. It doesn't matter. But the point is there's plenty of men who are as feminine in their personality as the average woman. That doesn't mean they're in the wrong body. It just means that men and women are more alike than different, even though they are different, and that there's a huge range within both genders. Well, and we need to know that right now, if you look at teenagers, for example, who want to switch genders, 95% of them are unbearably confused. That's what's causing that. And I think there's other reasons too. I think this is a conjecture. When the, when the trans teenagers came after me when I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada on compelled speech grounds, I, I spent quite a bit of time watching them. And I already kind of knew about that fluid identity crowd. So when I was at Harvard, piercing and, and tattooing started to become a cultural rage. And I was interested in, well, who's doing this? Because I knew it was, it was a practice that was limited to criminal subtypes and outcasts for a long time. So for example, if you worked in the circus, you were likely to be tattooed, you know, and you toured around the circus and that was a kind of carny life and it was an outsider life. And if you were a prisoner, same thing. But then all of a sudden it started to make its inroads into the popular culture. So we studied a group of early adopters of tattooing and piercing from the perspective of personality. Like, who are these people? And they were all highly creative people. Well, what it, and creativity is a trait and all people who aren't creative, that's wrong. In fact, most people aren't creative at all. And I can explain that later, but they're not. We, get, we developed a scale called the Creative Achievement Questionnaire, which assesses lifetime contribution to 13 different creative domains. And that your scores would range from zero, I have no training or talent in this area, to I think it was eight. Um, I'm an internationally recognized expert in this area, right? And so 70% of people, if you sum their scores across all 13 domains, scored zero and i ask audiences like how many portraits have you painted zero how many songs have you composed zero how many plays have you written zero okay, how many let recipes me, let me, have let you invented stop you. let me okay. stop you so um, the you tattooed stop. types are high they were high in creativity okay and a lot of these people who are fluid in their identity are actually high in trade openness and they do have fluid identities and some of them are feminine men and masculine women so, yeah, but that doesn't mean that surgery is the cure for that. That it does not mean that. I knew a kid in Toronto who was on the autistic spectrum, and a lot of the people who are manifesting serious issues with gender identity are on the autistic spectrum. This is like Abigail Schreier's work yeah, and yeah, rapid yeah. onset gender dysphoria yeah. amongst women. Yeah, well, that's a different thing, the rapid onset. That's more like, so part of the reason I objected to Bill Cesar 16 to begin with was because I knew full well as a clinician that as soon as we messed with fundamental sex categories and changed the terminology, we would fatally confuse thousands of young girls. I knew that because I knew the literature on psychological contagion. And it stretches back like 500 years, that literature, 300 years. It's all outlined in a book by Henri Ellenberger called History of, History of, what's the name of the book? History of Psychoanalytic Ideas, it doesn't matter. It's Henri Ellenberger and it's his main work if you want to look it up. And so psychological contagions are very common. And so one of them, for example, was the satanic uh, ritual abuse accusations that emerged in daycares in the 1980s. And that was a consequence of women going into the workforce en masse, leaving their children with strangers and starting to have pathological fantasies about it, especially if they were borderline schizophrenic and those fantasies propagated into the population. Okay, so you see people with blue hair, the blue haired crowd. Uh -huh. Well, they're the same people that were doing tattooing and piercing and they often are literally the same people because they have piercings. It's like, well, they have mutable identities. They're not, they're not stable in their identities. That's their, they're creative. C 
creative people by definition aren't stable in their identities. That's what makes them creative. Now, the downside of that is you can, creativity is a high risk, high return strategy. Your new idea is probably stupid and wrong, and maybe it's fatal. But now and then it's unbelievably successful. And also, now and then, our culture would die without it. So we, have, we always have this problem because we have to maintain stability because otherwise everything degenerates into chaos. But mere stability won't work because the future is different from the past. Like technically different, different in a non-deterministic way. It's actually different. And so then we have to figure out, well, how do we modify our memories or our traditions at a rate that enables us to keep up with the culture? And the answer to this is in part, we let creative people play multiple games on the fringe and some of them are radically successful and then we copy them. I also think, by the way, that part of what we're seeing in late adolescence with this insistence on the primacy of felt identity mm -hmm. is the re-emergence of suppressed fantasy play that should have taken place at, at, at between, say, three and five that's been suppressed by the imposition of technological artifacts like television and phones and by the absence of free play among children who are hyper-supervised. So the fantasy play is imperative to develop your identity by trying out a bunch of different patterns of behavior yes, exactly. and ways to be. Yes, so, so when my, my son, uh, so when my son was about two, his sister was about three and had a little gaggle of, of friends and they used to dress him up like a fairy princess. And this didn't happen for like years, it happened for a couple of weeks, you know, and he was playing along. And I went down there, and I'm a Northern Albertan, you know, and so the gender roles there were fairly finely de defined. And I was watching this, I thought, I only had qualms for like about two hours. I went and thought about it. I thought, okay, what's going on here? Well, he's playing with the girls. Okay, should he play with girls? Yes, definitely. He should play with girls, absolutely. Adult males should play with women. Like, we should be able to play with people of the opposite sex. Like, so, so he's learning to play with the girls. Good. Is he enjoying it? Yes. Are they bullying him? No. Are the girls enjoying it? Yes. That's all good. Okay, so what does it mean he's playing at being a girl? Oh, he's trying to understand what it means to be a girl. Well, how do you understand that when you're three? or maybe when you're 50, you play at it, which means you allow that pattern of being to inhabit you.